Come to order. Remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take up the election of the presiding officer for the 92nd legislature pursuant to Article 4, Section 15 of the Minnesota Constitution. Is there any discussion? Uh, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President Pro Tem, and um, thank you, um, Majority Leader Gazelka. You know, this was an issue that we brought up on the opening day of session when normally this would happen. And I just wanted to say that I'm very glad that the Senate GOP caucus has kind of come to your senses and realized that, yes, we do have to follow the Constitution, and the Constitution does require us to elect a president. Thank you. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. President Pro Tem. I too um, support the motion of the Majority Leader and, um, and follow the comments of Senator Pappas. We need to get this done today to send a message that we are fully organized according to the Constitution and according to the statutes of the state of Minnesota and our own traditions, uh, which um, all of us value um, very highly. So I'm pleased to be here to support the motion. Okay, on that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? We will actually go out to the rooms off to the side and get the vote count on this one. Having reported in from the side rooms, the motion does prevail. Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, you forgot to bring your gavel down. And I like that you called me Mr. President and not <laughs> Mr. President Pro Tem. The motion prevails. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. President. It's uh, good to have some light moments. And uh, Mr. President, I'm about to nominate Senator Miller, but when it's appropriate, uh, I'd like to make some comments about that. And so. Mr. President, I nominate Senator Jeremy Miller for President of the Senate. Senator Miller has been nominated. Are there any other nominations? Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I nominate Senator Bobby Joe Champion. Senator Bobby Joe Champion has been nominated for President. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, nominations are closed. Uh, Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Jeremy Miller uh, has been our president now and, and has shown us uh, what it's like uh, to be fair in that role as president, to listen to both sides, and to, to uh, do this uh, role uh, of bringing us together and making our, our process works. 
in a way that's professional, but also the fact is, I think, respected on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I, I, uh, I greatly value his ability to run the Senate the way he has, and uh, I think that he should return to that position. And having said that, I just want to say I also uh, uh, am appreciative of the input that I got, particularly from Senator Canton and Senator Pappas, Senator Marty, about uh, some of the traditions that we have here and how important they are. And I then reached out to Senator Kent again and to the governor about how do we correct that glitch that creates this as a political, a possible uh, political uh, activity to change power structure. And it was never meant to be that, uh, Mr. President. In the beginning, it, there wasn't Democrat and Republican. There was rural and, or I'm sorry, liberal and conservative, and they were spread out everywhere. And so uh, even after this, Mr. President, I hope that we move forward to actually correct this going forward, but I do believe the governor and uh, Susan Kent, the minority leader, do not want that to be part of the process that we have. Senator Pappas. Thank you again, Mr. President Pro Tem. The, um, I'm rising to support the nomination of Senator Bobby Joe Champion for President of the Senate. Um, I've known Bobby Joe, Senator Champion, for many years. He's a very um, hardworking and sincere legislator who works hard for his district in the state of Minnesota. Um, he strongly believes in our traditions, but I do think it's time for us to start a new tradition, and that is to uh, elevate someone from our body who represents communities that have not previously been represented here in this body to a very great extent. And I think that Senator Champion knows the rules and will do an excellent job as our Senate President, and I urge um, all of our members to support him. Are there any further comments? Any further discussion? Seeing none, the Secretary will call the roll in alphabetical order. Members, this is an alphabetical order, viva voce, roll call, so pay attention to the board so that you can be in the chamber at the time that you, your name gets called. The Secretary will call the roll. Senator Abler. Miller. Senator Anderson. Anderson. <laughs> Bach. Benson, Miller. Bigham, Champion. Carlson, Chamberlain, Miller. Champion, Clausen, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dames, Dibble, Champion. Dornick, Dornick, Dreheim, Duckworth, Dietzik, Dietzik, Eaton, Eichhorn, Eakin, Fate, Franzen, Friends, Gazelka, Goggin, Her, Hoffman, Miller, Housley, Howe, Ingebretson, Ingebretson, Isaacson, Jasinski, Johnson, Johnson Stewart. Kent, Kiffmeyer, Klein, Coran, Coran, Kunish, Lang, Latz, Limmer, Marty, Matthews, McEwen, Miller, Murphy, Nelson, Nelson, what, excuse me, Nelson? Thank you. Newman, Newton, 
Osmic, Pappas, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rest, Rosen, Rood, Senjum, Thomasoni, Torres Ray, Utke, Weber, Weber, Westrom, Weger, Wickland, um, Anderson. I guess we'll go with the remote. Okay. Dames. Anybody else I missed on that category? How? Dietzik. I guess Ready? all the rest of them are remote. You want me? Uh, Senjum votes Miller. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes Miller. Housley votes Miller. Senator Limmer votes Miller. Limmer votes Miller. Senator Westrom votes Miller. Westrom votes Miller. Senator Anderson B votes Miller. Anderson B votes Miller. Senator Icorn votes Miller. Icorn votes Miller. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes Miller. Ingebrigtsen votes Miller. Senator Goggin votes Miller. Goggin votes Miller. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President Pro Tem. Senator Carlson votes champion. Carlson votes champion. Senator Clausen votes champion. Clausen votes champion. Senator Eaton votes champion. Eaton votes champion. Senator Herr votes champion. Herr votes champion. Senator Isaacson votes champion. Isaacson votes champion. Senator Latz votes champion. Latz votes champion. Senator Newton votes Miller. Newton votes Miller. Senator Torres Ray votes champion. Torres Ray votes champion. Thank you. There being 38 votes for Senator Miller and 29 votes for Senator Champion, Senator Miller has been elected President of the Senate. Senator Miller, please come forward and subscribe to the oath of office. Senator Miller, do you solemnly swear to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota and to discharge faithfully your duties as President of the Senate to the best of your judgment and ability? So help you God. I do. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you, members. It's uh, uh, truly an honor to be one of 67 members to serve in this chamber, the Minnesota Senate, and uh, truly an honor to serve in the position of uh, Senate President. I appreciate the continued trust and support. And at a time when there's so much civil unrest, and as we come off of a very divisive election cycle, I think it's more important than ever that we show Minnesotans that we can work together and we can govern and we can lead in a way that is good for the people of the state of Minnesota. So I appreciate the, the continued support and it sure feels good to be back in the saddle. With that said, we will uh, continue with uh, motions and resolutions. The secretary will report Senate resolution number six. Senators Gazelka and Kent introduce Senate Resolution No. 6, a Senate resolution relating to the rules, adopting temporary rules for the 92nd session of the legislature. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate Resolution No. 6 be adopted. To that motion, Senator Gazelka. This is simply the adoption of those temporary rules. Members, uh, this uh, does require a roll call vote. Before we take the roll, is there any discussion on the rules? Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have an amendment to offer. Is this the proper time? Yes, it is, Senator Wicklin. Do you have the number on the amendment? Yeah, it is. Um, yes, it's uh, amendment, the A51. Senator Wicklin offers the A51 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Wicklin moves to amend Senate Resolution Number 6 as follows, page 5 after line 18, insert. This is the A51 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yes, I bring this amendment forward. Um, we know, we all know that uh, due to the COVID pandemic, we have to adapt our uh, work procedures um, to make our workplace safe and effective and in order to have the kind of session that we all want to have, which is productive, um, effective, transparent for all, um, all of our members, um, we need to adapt and um, modify our practices so that we are consistently following the public health risk mit mitigation strategies that um, are being um, followed in large part across our state um, and we need to do that consistently in our, our body here as well. In order to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 in our workplace and make it safe for all of us to participate. Um, this rule that I'm bringing, uh, modification that I'm bringing forward in the amendment would add a rule that all members and employees must wear face coverings as provided in the rule. Um, this is a way to, uh, ensure consistency in our chamber activities and um, for everyone to know that this is an expect expectation um, for all when they're working in the Capitol complex. Um, other state legislatures have uh, incorporated this type of a rule in their, their state, their legislative rules. Um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois have all incorporated rules such as this. North Dakota has also adopted a rule for their entire, um, their entire legislative body that face coverings are required in all of their uh, Capitol buildings. Um, by doing this, you know, we show to our members, our colleagues, our staff that we all care and show and have mutual respect for uh, the role that each of us play in the Senate. We each come here uh, representing our constituents and we want to do that in a safe um, and effective manner. Um, by putting this in our rules, it just it demonstrates that we know that this is uh, something that we all can agree to and abide by in order to have a safe working environment. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion on the A51 amendment. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you know, as I, I think about this, I, I do appreciate the spirit of, uh, of the amendment, except for the fact 
that it's mandated versus strongly encouraged. And, and we do have in our Senate guidelines uh, the encouragement of wearing the masks uh, because um, it probably is helpful. And, and the reason I say that is it's interesting. I just recently read some news from California. California has the strictest lockdown in the U.S., and yet they have the most active COVID cases by far. And if you look to Wisconsin or you look to uh, Colorado, they, they are not nearly as strict as Minnesota, and yet they have less deaths in Minnesota, even though their populations are greater than Minnesota. And just as we started session Tuesday, we, I put out a letter strongly encouraging members of the Senate to wear the mask coming in here. Part of it uh, is uh, simply respecting those that uh, may have a different point of view. But frankly, the farther you get out into uh, Minnesota, uh, you, have, you do have a different attitude. People don't view it the same. And we have to figure out how to accommodate both of those sides. And so my, I believe the, the position that the Senate has taken is the appropriate side, and that is that we strongly encourage the, the, the mask wearing. If you've noticed, we have social distancing in here, and that I'm aware of through the process that we have done in the Senate, the way we have done it right now. Not one person has been infected while doing their operation here at the Senate. And so, Mr. President, with that, I offer the A-52 amendment to the amendment. Senator Gazelka offers the A-52 amendment to the amendment. Uh, discussion on the amendment, Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, and this simply says, all members and employees are strongly encouraged to wear face mask coverings as provided in this rule. A face mask should be worn over an individual's nose and mouth within the Senate chamber. This rule does not apply to members and employees who are addressing the entire Senate in the chamber. This rule expires on the day following the termination of peacetime emergency declared by the governor in Executive Order 20-01 and extends, extended in any subsequent executive orders. So it acknowledges that we are encouraging people to wear the mask, but it does not mandate it. The Secretary will report the amendment to the amendment. Senator Gazelka moves to amend the Wickland Amendment to Senate Resolution Number 6 as follows, page 1, delete lines 16 to 23, and insert. This is the A52 Amendment. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Senator Marty. Mr. President, I, I think Senator Gazelka's amendment is basically means we don't have a rule. We encourage, we don't pass rules that encourage, we pass rules to require certain things. We have certain members of the Senate who, because of personal health conditions, do not feel comfortable coming here, participating in the debate that they were elected to participate in, because others are not wearing masks. I think it's outrageous to say, well, it's good enough because they have different opinions that we don't have to wear masks in the chamber or in committee hearings or other places. It's outrageous. Some members have personal health reasons that they can't be here because we're not willing to wear masks. If you don't want to wear masks at home, don't wear them at home. If you don't want to wear them in your home community and you're legally allowed to do what you're doing and you're willing to put other lives at risk, fine, you can do that. I don't want to encourage that. I think we should say, if the masks are going to protect somebody else, which is why we're wearing them, the mask you're wearing and the mask I'm wearing are not primarily helping us. They may help us some. But the primary reason for it is to stop the transmission to others. And if some members want to be selfish and say, I don't feel, I don't like it, and I don't care what happens to my colleagues, I say, shame on them. This is absolutely outrageous. Senator Wickland comes up with a carefully worded amendment, allows exceptions if you want to speak into a microphone without a mask on for those minutes. But the rest of the time, when you're not in your own office, be sensitive to the people around you. Talking about, well, we have different opinions about this. Yeah, we have different opinions about all kinds of infectious diseases but most of us don't want to spread them to other people. 
I cannot see any reason not to adapt Senator Wicklund's amendment as it is. This amendment to the amendment is nothing other than canceling out the amendment. We already have an encouragement, and it's not been good enough for some members. I really would like to have the members who feel that it's too much of a burden to wear a mask. I'd like them to talk to some of the colleagues who are scared to come here because they know people aren't wearing masks. I'd like to talk, have them talk to people who've been stricken with COVID. We've lost one of our colleagues to that. Out of 67 members, we've lost one. I don't care where they got it. You're saying we don't care enough to wear masks around others to protect our colleagues because we got a different opinion? I'm sorry I'm emotional about this, but this is really outrageous. I strongly urge you to vote down the amendment and then to support Senator Wicklund's full change in the rules as for roll call. All right, members, a roll call has been requested, a roll call granted. I have a list started. I have Senator Gazelka followed by Senator Wicklund. Senator uh, thank Gazelka. you, Mr. President. Uh, members, uh, Senator Marty, yeah, the reason why that I want to make it uh, strongly encouraged, encouraged rather than mandate is it creates all kinds of situations where what happens if somebody in some situation is not wearing the mask is that a, is that an ethics violation uh, how do we how do we navigate through this uh, when we decided to allow uh, people to vote remotely it acknowledged that some people are concerned about their health or the health of others but in particular their own health and that was that was uh, the idea behind Rather, rather than mandating voluntaries, if somebody's concerned about their health, we have given them the option to vote remotely, to be here and participate without being here directly. And to me, the voluntary is the best of both worlds. If you want to be here, you can be here. And, and like I said, we practice social distancing. Nobody has been infected at any time here that I'm aware of. And so we, we allow people to do both. If it's mandated, we do not allow people to be both. And if it's mandated, then we might as well have everybody here uh, in person, which is the, the goal that I want to get to anyway. And so if that's where people are at, I would be open to that as well. But I do think the, the approach that we have taken, where we strongly encourage, which means for almost everybody, virtually everybody's wearing them, uh, but allowing you to be home and to be safe if, if you were in one of those vulnerable classes and you've not been vaccinated yet, I think is a fit that's a compromise between both sides. Next, I have Senator Wicklund, followed by Senator Benson. Senator Wicklund. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I speak in opposition to this amendment. Um, it basically just um, eliminates the, the proposed rule change that I brought forward. And with all due respect, Senator Gazelka, we saw even on the first day of session, that there are a significant number who have chosen not to wear masks. And that has a significant impact on members' comfort and willingness to be in the chamber and doing their work that they should be able to do fully here in the chamber when they need to. Yes, they can stay at home and they can re vote remotely, but we don't have uh, full participation remotely. Uh, we are able to, to participate remotely by way of voting and roll calls, and that's all. That is not true of the other, other half of our body. Uh, they have implemented a way, and many other state legislatures have implemented ways for full participation from those who are not in the chamber. Um, and so it is not, um, simply isn't um, equivalent to say that we have strongly encouraged members to wear them and that's sufficient. Uh, we should be worried, we should be caring about um, our members being able to participate fully in their role as state senators, and that includes being in the building when they choose to. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Benson followed by Senator Chamberlain. Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Marty, uh, Mr. President, would Senator Marty yield to a question? Senator Marty will yield. Senator Benson. Thank you. Senator Marty, if we implement a mask mandate and maintain physical distancing, can we 
then eliminate remote voting and start meeting in person? Will we be safe enough to have committee meetings in person, to be here physically on the floor so that we can have a greater semblance of normal debate, normal amendment process, normal bill movement? Will we be able to be physically present if we implement masking and physical distinct distancing? Senator Marty. Mr. President, Senator Benson, I think it would move us closer in that direction. I think we're going to get to that point at some point. Maybe it's after vaccines are here and fully available to everyone. I hope we can get that way. I prefer dealing with people face to face. It's much better. But it's not necessarily the case that because we have this mass mandate, all of a sudden it becomes safe. For the members who have health, underlying health conditions that are scared to come here right now and their doctors are advising against it, I would not tell them you should come in here. Now, oh, everybody's wearing masks, that makes it fine. It makes it safer for those who recognize there's a risk. Everything we do in life has risks. You wear a mask, if everybody wear a mask, it reduces the risk. So I think more people will feel more comfortable with it and I'm hoping we can get to fully in-person stuff soon too. But I don't think we're there and I don't think the masks alone are gonna do it. So the simple answer is masks are a step forward. It doesn't solve the problem. Senator Benson. Mr. President, and it has been stated several times, even after the vaccine, there's an expectation that people will have to wear masks, and we can debate that in the health committee um, as to why that would be. But let's be clear, the, the mask mandate isn't gonna go away with the vaccine. Um, there's still risk of shedding, according to Dr. Fauci. So uh, it feels like we want it both ways. Grocery store clerks, waiters and waitresses show up for work in person with masking. So let's be clear, if we do a mandate, I think the public should expect us to be here talking to each other, present to one another. Uh, Mr. President, would Senator Wicklund please yield? Senator Wicklund will yield. Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wicklund, what would the consequences be under your mandate if a member was caught without a mask, say, alone in a hallway, um, or if an employee was sitting at their desk without a mask and nobody within, say, 10 feet of them? What would be the consequence? Senator Wicklund. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Benson, I don't have a, spell, uh, a protocol spelled out for consequence if you think that this amendment should require that. Uh, obviously, I, my goal is compliance and just having people know that they're expected to wear a mask when they're in the Capitol complex. If they're not speaking on the floor, if they're not speaking in a committee, or if they're not in their own office alone. Um, if you think that the lack of definition of, a, of an outcome um, is needed to make sure that this works properly, um, I'm happy to entertain, uh, you know, modified language for that. Senator Benson. So, Mr. President, given that we don't know what the consequence is, this could result in an ethics charge. We don't know if it will result in discipline for an employee. I mean, we worked very hard on some of our um, human resources policy as it relates to harassment, discrimination, et cetera. There are very clear consequences. That's the responsibility of the person who's bringing a rule change forward. Mr. President, I think Senator Gazelka's amendment is a reasonable step to allow emphasis for an important consideration for our colleagues who do have significant health concerns but it doesn't go so far as to threaten someone's career or an ethics charge, which is where rules changes go. Mr. President, I would support the Gazelka Amendment. Next on the list, we have Senator Chamberlain followed by Senator Rest. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, I wish to submit some information for your uh, uh, deep consideration on this matter. We are all deeply concerned about the situation in which we find ourselves, um, and we all wish that it would at some point go away. However, that date and that time 
and that uh, scenario is yet to be explained fully to the citizens of the state of Minnesota, let alone to the body that uh, we are now uh, representing. So, number one, we have uh, no clear idea of how long that would last. Um, this can go on in perpetuity. The governor said the other day he would not, he had no intention on lifting his uh, emergency powers, removing or relenting on them. Well, maybe he was joking, maybe it was tongue in cheek. I do not know, but that is what he said. Uh, so it leaves one to wonder, as was uh, mentioned by a colleague of mine in discussions, where does this go, where does this end, what is next? Uh, we all are concerned about the health and welfare of our colleagues and our family members. I am concerned about uh, whether you get anything, right? Uh, sometimes my doctor, my doctor has probably advised me to stay away from here for my heart and mental health conditions. Nonetheless, I come here anyway. Um, now, for your consideration, we have data and there's data on all sides. But this is just, should be a nonpartisan discussion about this data. First, in June of 2020, in a podcast with Joe Rogan, an interview podcast with the Joe Rogan, Mr. Osterholm, Dr. Osterholm, whom we all know and, and respect, said unequivocally that masks do not work, members. Dr. Osterholm, who is now heading up or part of the Biden administration, President-elect Biden's administration uh, for infectious diseases, said June in, on, in June 2020 on a podcast that masks don't work. The governor implemented a mask mandate in sometime in mid-late July of 2020, hoping to stem the spread of uh, the COVID virus. It is quite obvious that that did not work. And now people might debate whether the mask uh, compliance was, was uh, where it should be. Most people will say when I go into stores anecdotally, I see almost everybody in a mask. Um, so in spite of uh, what uh, Dr. Osholm said, masks don't work. We implemented a mask mandate, the governor did in July. All for good intentions, I'm sure. I'm not here to impugn that, just the data, members, just the data. He um, implemented that. Compliance has been very high. I think if anybody suggests it's not, I think that's not totally uh, straightforward. Finally, uh, so the next thing, we, we did get a surge in early November. Then the governor, uh, a couple weeks later, uh, cr uh, implemented the pause with the executive order. So in November 2020, uh, there was a study released from uh, Denmark, the Danish mass study. It's easy to find, Google it. I was aware of it a couple weeks ago. The Danish, Danish mass study was released, and they found virtually no difference in the mass were not affected. They found virtually no difference between the, the control group and the group that wore masks in the rate of infection. Now, members, that's just the data. That's a study. Don't yell at me. Go talk to the Danish folks. Get the study. Look at it. Uh, check the graph for the mask mandate and the surge. And you can find uh, Google Joe Rogan. You can find Joe Rogan, Osterholm interview. So members, um, if the public or anybody else is angry with me about this, ask them. Look at it. So then the confusion is, then if it does not work, what are we doing? Are we going to do things that work, or is it the government's role to continue to do things that don't work? I would suggest that if people want to wear masks, that is perfectly fine, because there are people with immune deficiencies out there that always take precautions about things. Always take precautions. So members, I would urge you to look at the stuff, and then I would also suggest that we take some time to think about that data. <laughs> Think about that information. Again, a mass study, the surge, Joe Osterholm, uh, Dr. Osterholm. Um, these are just things out there. And, and what is a citizen or a legislator to do? We just arbitrate, we just say, well, let's do a mass mandate. Well, 
the, the data I see and I have seen is that it doesn't work. Dr. Fauci said it didn't work until he said it did. So um, consider the data, consider the information, and that's kind of where a lot of citizens are. What good does it do? What are we doing here? And if you want to wear it, I think that's fine. But uh, to suggest, Mr. President, Mr. President members, to suggest that not wearing a mask is somehow, somehow unethical or we don't care, that is where I take umbrage with any of my colleagues. Serious umbrage. That is, I would say, also a violation of our sacred rules in this chamber to imply intent. We care about each other. I care about my family. But to imply that is something else. So just consider the data members, consider the information. That's where the public is. We're confused. Um, and we should be here working. Um, and, you know, if we all wear masks, if I agree to wear a mask, then people should come into work. Thank you for your time. Next on the list is Senator Rest, followed by Senator Johnson Stewart. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you. Mr. President, I strongly support Senator Wicklund's original uh, motion to amend the rules to mandate um, mask wearing. I believe that actually, um, according to current Senate rules, that we are under such a mandate, whether we pass Senator Wicklund's uh, uh, proposal or or Senator uh, Gazelka's. And regardless, I will, as a matter of duty, as a member of this Senate, when I see someone in this chamber without a mask on, other than under the circumstances that are described in Senator Wicklund's uh, proposal, I will rise to a point of order, and that point of order will be Rule 56.1, and I'm sure the President is familiar with that. It calls upon us to indeed exhibit the highest ethical standards, and in my mind, and if anyone wants to impugn my motives, go right ahead. My motive is that we have the highest standards of our conduct and our behavior in this chamber, and it does indeed mean respect for one another's health, um, principles, values, and, and that we want to protect them against ourselves and any kind of behavior that does not reach that highest ethical standard. So I'm going to vote against <laughs> Senator um, Gazelka's motion. If that does not prevail, I'm going to vote for Senator Wicklund's motion. But be advised, any time I am on this floor, and this is the first time I've been here in 10 months, I will rise to a point of order under Rule 56.1. Thank you, Mr. President. Next on the list, I have Senator Johnson Stewart, followed by Senator Marty, I believe, tried to get my attention. Senator Johnson Stewart. I'm new here. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> uh, as I said, I'm new here. Uh, you can see I'm wearing a suit coat today. I really don't care to wear one. I'd much rather be in more comfortable clothing. But during freshman orientation, we were told that we were required to dress appropriately for our work in the Senate. And so, appropriately, I showed up dressed like my colleagues. I wonder, uh, Senator Chamberlain, how he would feel if I chose to wear my swimming suit tomorrow. Or perhaps, or I guess on Monday, correct? Perhaps my bathrobe. Or maybe I chose that my feet are uncomfortable in the shoes I'm wearing, and I chose to come barefoot. 
How is that any different than me choosing to wear a suit coat to honor this place on my third day here? I'm agreeing to the rules because that's the commitment that I made to this office and to my colleagues. I'm wearing a suit coat. I will wear one every day I appear on the Senate floor because that's the expectation. You may not know I'm a construction engineer. When I write uh, specifications and I use language should, that means the contractor must. So I was surprised to hear Senator Gazelka say we are going to strongly suggest that people wear a mask and they should do it. To me, that's a, that's a conflict. If someone should do something, then we're saying they should do it. So my concern is how we abide by rules, how we raise to the level of expectation, how we meet the needs of our colleagues, regardless of what party they come from, and how we show respect for this office. I am happy to wear a mask. I am happy to wear a suit coat. And I am happy not to wear a swimming suit, frankly. But I will do it if challenged. So I will vote against Senator Gazelka's amendment. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Marty, followed by Senator Wicklin. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to respond to a couple of points that were made earlier, one of which was Senator Benson said something about the penalties. What are the penalties? I look through the rules, I see lots of things don't have penalties. I remember Senator Limber when he sat in the front row many times being called on by, for violating the rule about addressing the president. He turned around and addressed the president. He changed his behavior to comply with the rules. It didn't require anything else because members tend to want to follow the rules. So let's just put it in the rules. People do tend to follow them. The second point I wanted to make, Senator Gazelka said, well, if we have uh, several of the proponents of the Gazelka Amendment said, if we have this, we're going to have ethics complaints. I think I, we should put people on notice now that I think it deserves an ethics complaint, whether it's in the rules or not. Because as Senator Rest mentioned the rules about highest level of decorum and respect for others. If we have people staying away or not participating fully in debate because of concerns about their health because of the behavior of others, I think that's grounds for ethics complaints. And I like Senator Rest's point of, point of order because that's why we call that, because we want people to comply with the rules. This proposal by Senator Gazelka is not a rule. He's undercutting Senator Wicklin's thing. You should just vote against Senator Wicklin's amendment if he doesn't like it, because this simply undoes what she does and brings it back to what he says we have now, recommendations. And finally, I want to say, we've been talking about us as 67 senators. We haven't talked a lot about the larger number of people around us, the employees, many of whom are able to work at home now, but many of them have to be in here as well, and they don't have a choice. And I want to point out, and this is something I did not experience or witness myself, but I have heard from one staff person that the staff person who complained about a senator failing to wear a mask within a nearby distance was reprimanded for not knowing their behavior as a staff by scolding a senator for not behaving properly. I think that's really outrageous. I think we need a rule just to protect the staff. If you're going to be here, we have, yeah, you got to wear a tie if you're a male, you got to wear a coat. Women have to dress appropriately. We make those sacrifices. Putting a face covering on isn't the biggest sacrifice in the world for the health and well being of your colleagues and your staff. I think it's absolutely outrageous that we're talking about this being a recommendation, putting a recommendation into the rules. Senator Wicklin has a good amendment. I strongly urge us to it. Let's just get it done. You're going to have the ethics complaints with or without this rule. You're not going to have ethics complaints if people are wearing their masks. Next on the list, we have Senator Wicklin, followed by Senator Johnson. Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. Um, Senator Marty addressed a couple of the points that I was going to make. Um, number one, Senator Benson asked about penalties. I don't see penalties in the rules for many of the, the items that are listed. 
but yet we seem to exist with those without um, members feeling uncomfortable that they don't know what's going to happen. Um, Senator Benson raised that if we have a mask uh, mandate, uh, will we just be able to go back to meeting in person? And I think that that is uh, something to be examined, but I think Senator Benson knows that all of the mitigation measures go together. This isn't the only thing that protects us or mitigates risk. There are multiple layers to it. So those multiple layers need to be considered when deciding uh, what is a, a relatively lower risk opportunity for us to be together, um, sharing space, and um, being able to do it safely. So the mask is one consideration, but we should do that um, anyway. We should be wearing masks. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Johnson followed by Senator Port. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. So it, it seems like we are debating the underlying amendment. Um, if uh, I guess that's important in the context here. Is that appropriate to be uh, talking about the underlying amendment? Uh, Senator Johnson, in this case, I, I feel like they are uh, connected. Um, so I am letting a little leeway, but I, I feel like it's appropriate. Excellent. Senator Thank Johnson. you. Uh, Mr. President, would Senator Wickland please um, stand for question? Senator Wickland will yield. Senator Johnson. I'd, I'd just like to get back to the, the amendment, the language of the amendment itself. Um, on here, I uh, want to be pretty careful on what we're, we're talking about. So could you give me a definition of face covering or, if not, where we might be able to find guidelines uh, for that definition? Senator Wicklund. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, face covering, I think there's a lot of um, general knowledge about face covering since it is a, you know, something that is commonly used. Um, it can be made out of different materials, cloth of different types. Um, I think that reasonably members would understand how to determine what a face covering is. Senator Johnson. And I think we need to be careful on that, too, because I think there are a number of guidelines. So if, if it doesn't meet a high ethical standard, I think that phrase has been uh, mentioned a couple of times, uh, we've got to be pretty careful on what that material is going to be and what that mask is going to be made of. I think that's something that we really need to be uh, taking into account in this situation, because if you have something that uh, defeats the purpose of, of what you believe a mask should be doing, um, then we have to really look at it. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, can I ask Senator Wickland uh, what the underlying purpose of that mask is? Senator I'm, Wickland will continue I'm sorry, to yield. I, can you repeat the question, Senator yes. Johnson? What, what is the underlying purpose, Mr. President, of the mask, uh, and therefore what should the material be made out of? What's our standard is what I'm the asking. Under, Senator uh, Wickman. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Mr. Senator President. Wickman. The underlying purpose of the mask is to uh, rid, um, mitigate the risk of transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Both MDH and the CDC have extensively written details about what constitutes um, masks, uh, sufficient masks, better masks. Um, there's a whole, um, certainly much literature on their websites about what would be an appropriate mask. And I believe that that is what we ask people to go look at when they want to determine whether a mask they see that's on the market is um, sufficient. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Senator Wickland, for that answer. So when I look around the floor today, if we, if we go by the CDC guidelines, a couple of things, gaiters, single layer gaiters, which I've seen today, are not part of that. Uh, face shields are not part of it. Another one that, that's interesting is uh, taking it off. Uh, I've seen the way that the members uh, have been taking off the masks, uh, clearly not up to the high ethical standards of 56.1. Uh, I've, I've seen face shields used. Uh, I've seen people touching their face, which after, according to the CDC, after you've touched 
your mask, you're not supposed to be wearing that. Again, another violation of 56.1. So I just wanted to point out the dangers of invoking that. The other thing, too, I want to touch base on is looking at uh, chapter 17 or section 17 here of our temporary rules that we've used the last couple of years. There they clearly define what buildings or what areas uh, the uh, underlying paragraphs are applicable to, such as the Senate floor, Senate chambers, galleries, different things like this. This seems pretty open-ended. Uh, just wondering if a senator in their district caught without wearing their mask would also be subject to 56.1 as well. Senator Johnson, are you asking Senator Wicklin? Oh, I'm sorry. If Senator Wicklin uh, would answer, please. Senator Wicklin will yield. Senator Wicklin, do you want him to repeat the question or did you hear it? Thank you, Mr. President. No, he doesn't need to repeat the question. The, it's clear. The Capitol complex is the buildings, the Capitol, Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota Senate building, buildings surrounding it. I think that's very clear. Thank you. Senator Johnson. And just in conclusion, so I think just structurally, I think there's some significant issues within the amendment itself that need to be addressed before we adopt something uh, quite as stringent as this. So I just wanted to make a couple of those points. Thank you, Mr. President. Next on the list, we have Senator Port, followed by Senator Murphy. Members, we are on the A52 amendment to the A51 amendment. As I mentioned to Senator Johnson, they are very closely connected, so I'm allowing some leeway, but we are on the A52 amendment to the amendment. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to urge members to vote, ag vote against the amendment to the amendment. Uh, the day before opening day, we received communication from the majority leader that in strongly encouraged all of us to wear face coverings, just like this amendment strongly encourages it. As was very clear that day, that was not very well taken. Um, there were a number of members who did not wear face coverings, as Senator Klein pointed out, uh, that puts us all at greater risk. We have asked the people of Minnesota to make extraordinary sacrifices this year. They have been with us, they have made them, they have kept their communities safer in so many ways. As we are now starting the process of reopening, my kids will go back to school in two weeks. I am asking you to help us make our safe space as safe as possible and as safe as we are asking the people of Minnesota to make theirs. Uh, this, is, this is not just us, uh, like Senator Marty pointed out, this is our staff, but it's also our families and it's the teachers of our children. Um, it's the people that our spouses work with. This does not just affect us, it affects many people across Minnesota and I think that this is a symbol that we can give that both does something specific to protect us but also shows the people of Minnesota that we are with them. Um, just as a final point, I will, I will note that when we received our orientation uh, as new members to this incredible body, which I'm very honored to be a part of, you know, we were told that there is a dress code uh, and that it is business professional for women uh, and no one was willing to tell us what that meant. Uh, but we, did let, we were told by other members that they had been told that they could not enter the chamber with open-toed sandals. Um, while, you know, red toenails might be scandalous to some of the people in this chamber, they are not a risk to our health. And I think that we can, can make the point that we are caring for each other and are being, being specific and, and agreeing with the people of Minnesota that we need to do our part, just like we have asked them to do their part. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Murphy, followed by Senator Matthews. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I am rising to speak against Senator Gazelka's amendment to the amendment. There are a number of members of this body today who are working from home remotely. Senator Gazelka asserted that those working remotely from home have their vote protected and so therefore are fully participating. But only if you are on the floor are you able to speak and fully represent the interests of the people who sent you to this body? By amending Senator Wicklund's amendment to the rules, 
Senator Kazalka is creating a second class of senators and therefore a second class of Minnesotans. Mary Ellen Otremba, who used to work and serve in the legislature, fought aggressively for the people she represented in the district that she represented. And she said that the people she represented should never be treated as second class. Senator Gazalka's amendment to the amendment creates two classes of participation. This body should never stand for that. The science is very clear on masking. We have lost a member of this body. There's a new variant of the virus. It is more transmissible. We should be wearing masks to protect each other. We should defeat Senator Gazalka's amendment to the amendment because it creates a second class of senator and a second class of Minnesotan, and not one of us should stand for that. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Matthews, followed by Senator Klein. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, first off, I want to say thank you to the body that we're having this discussion in the form of motions and resolutions and a debate here on the floor, because that is the proper means that we should be discussing this, where we all get to have our input, where we get to have our vote, and we decide to set the rules here for the Senate and the laws that we have for Minnesota. What I have seen most often as I go around the, my district is many people have been voluntarily wearing masks even before the executive order came out. In fact, the first mask that was ever given to me uh, back when we were in the very early stages of this virus was from a person who saw the, the early reports that were coming out, the shortages that our healthcare workers had at first, and she undertook herself to start making homemade masks before it became a popular thing on the internet to try to give to some people that she knew, friends and family, uh, and get that out there. People were on it doing the right thing from the beginning. Masks were not the problem, mask mandate became the problem when the governor came along and said, by executive order, I myself am going to declare this rule for all Minnesotans, no voice, no process, no way to have this form of debate here in session. So I am very glad that we are having this debate and that we get to uh, view, uh, that we get to express our opinions here. I want to uh, rise and share with members, it is disappointing to hear uh, how this is being taken at a time when we have struggled over all of last year and already into the start of this year, the struggles and the difficulties and the turmoils that we're facing as a state and a nation. We have to stop finding things to use as wedge issues against each other and start trying to come together and be respectful of people's views, whether they be your own or whether they be differing ones. Uh, people have said, they, many people gave uh, uh, expressions that they were glad when the calendar flipped from 2020 and they were glad to have that year behind. Well, folks and friends, the problems are not what an external circumstances are without us. It's not dependent on the year or circumstances without us. How good or bad our year will be is going to be dependent on the choices within us. And we have to start making better choices and how we treat and respect each other if we're going to expect better outcomes than all the trauma and turmoil that we've experienced in the last year. And to hear statements made like, we'll be filing ethics complaints whether we have this rule or not, I don't think helps our situation whatsoever with this. And in fact, Mr. President, I want to read the full rules that's been referenced earlier. If you do uh, get a point of order under 56.1, uh, here's the rule in the entirety for your consideration, Mr. President. Members shall adhere to the highest standard of ethical conduct as embodied in the Minnesota Constitution, state law, and these rules. And that's the point of what we're going to have with this discussion here today, but I think you do need to have that full consideration uh, for any decisions that you make. Uh, I also want to point members to the rule that's right after that in 56.2. 
that says a member shall not publish or distribute written material if the member knows or has reason to know that the member includes any statement that is false or clearly misleading concerning a public policy issue or concerning members or another member's voting record or position on a public policy issue. And I want members to be aware and be careful in how we uh, treat and, and how we'll assign uh, beliefs or motives to others as we go about this process. We need to be fair, we need to be respectful. I have done that to people, whether they uh, want to wear a mask or not, whether they want to meet in person or not. I think that we should all do that uh, for one another here. I think we do need to stay at Strongly Encourage. I know many people uh, are voluntarily wearing masks. In fact, I'll share a story from uh, Tuesday here briefly because Yes, I was put out on the media as one of the eight members that took my oath of office to uphold the Constitution uh, without a mask on. What the media won't tell you that because they didn't know of is right outside the doors, I had my mask on where I was greeting another member that I was meeting for the first time, one of our new colleagues here, and I knew that that was likely going to be their expectation and desire. Uh, so I put my mask on while we were in line waiting to be handed our certificates and come out here. And then I took my mask off to come in and take the oath of office when everybody was six feet away or more away from me in this chamber uh, the entire time, clearly beyond the distance uh, that the uh, rules require of us. And that was my choice, and you may agree or disagree with my choice, that's okay. Um, we had multiple times where we saw uh, members that were taking their mask off after they uh, got off camera. I apparently took my mask off to get on camera on Tuesday, uh, but that was my choice. And you may agree or disagree on that or not, uh, but I think we should leave this to choice. If we can keep this off of mandates, people will uh, be more willing to be doing the right thing and voluntarily wearing them. People started bucking this more when it became masks. I saw people who were pro-masks turn anti over the mask mandate. So I appreciate this discussion that we're having here in the rules today. I will support uh, the Gazelka motion. I think we need to leave it at strongly encouraging and not go down the rules of these uh, rules and mandates to people that don't agree with us. Thank you, Mr. President. Next, we have Senator Klein followed by Senator Kunish. Senator Thank you, Klein. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I'll be extremely brief. My colleagues have spoken to the issue. I support the Wickland Amendment. I oppose the Gazelka Amendment, and I have little to add to what has already been said, except that two uh, medical facts were laid out by Senator Chamberlain on the, on the floor, and I don't want those to remain uncontested. Uh, on the record. Senator Abler has warned me that when we get into sort of disputing medical literature here on the floor, we lose audience in a big hurry, so I'll keep it very brief. Uh, the Danish study uh, that purported to show no benefit from masks did not show that at all. Uh, the study showed an 18% decrease in uh, infections of the mask wearer, uh, but it was not statistically significant, so it was inconclusive. It did not measure to see whether masks prevented prevented transmission of the virus from you to somebody else, which is naturally the biggest reason that we wear them here on the floor. So the Danish study is contradicted by numerous recent population studies that show mask mandates decrease transmission and mask penetrance decreases transmission. If we were to grab 10 random infectious disease specialists from across the country, every one of them would come in here and support the validity and usage uh, and safety of masks. Um, Second point would be I have to defend my good uh, friend, Dr. Olsterholm, uh, who, if he had the opportunity to speak on his own behalf today, would once again say that he uh, was not fully clear in those June comments. It was early in the pandemic. We have learned, obviously, a great deal more since that time. He has repeatedly uh, advocated since then for universal masking uh, because he knows the science that supports the health benefits of that. So uh, to, to quote that uh, interview from June is to misrepresent his views on this subject. Thank you, Mr. President. Next on the list, we have Senator Kunish, followed by Senator Rest. Senator Kunish. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I stand here this, this afternoon um, 
uh, knowing that early on in this pandemic, I lost my, my father-in-law, and just yesterday I lost my sister-in-law um, after being removed from uh, life support and uh, a ventilator. Um, if, and my point is here, um, I am in support of the Wickland uh, Amendment and not so much for uh, the Gazelka Amendment. And the point is, is that if we all did what we should do because we know it's the right thing to do and not out of defiance, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, the, everywhere we go in this complex, we see signs on the door that says masks are required. And we're supposed to take our temperature when we go in and out of doorways, and we're supposed to wash our hands, and we're supposed to stand 10 feet apart. That hasn't happened much at all since I've been here in the last few days. And in fact, yesterday after coming back over here, I was in a small vestibule where uh, senators did not have a mask on, and they were minimizing the effect of a mask and actually sort of uh, play coughing into the general space space, a very small space, and I cannot tell you how horrified I was by that. Some people do these sort of things because they care about each other. They care about themselves, their families, and each and every single one of us. And when I see that sort of defiance, it reminds me of students that I've had over the 25 years as a teacher who says, why do I have to do that? I don't want to have to do that. My mom says, I don't have to do that. And we say, because it's the rules, because it keeps you safe, it keeps us safe, and that's what we do here. And what we do here in the Senate is to protect the people of Minnesota, and that means we are protecting each other as well. And so I would ask all of my fellow senators and staff members in the entire complex, if we can't make this a mandate, please be respectful and responsible enough and let the defiance go away. Please wear your masks in honor and support of every single one of us. I would say it would be hard pressed to, to uh, identify anybody here who has not lost a loved one or a friend or knows somebody who, loved, who lost their loved one. And so I would ask that you support the Wickland Amendment and ensure that yes, we're going to do the right thing because there are those that won't. Thank you. Next on the list, we have Senator Rest. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, um, someone earlier uh, raised the issue of um, what is Senator a... Rest, we're having a hard time hearing you. Can you put, either put the microphone underneath your shield or no. talk a little louder, please? Here's the problem. Someone earlier raised the question about what is a face covering. They referenced maybe a face shield is not a face covering. Maybe a gator is not a face covering. I also am wearing what other people are wearing, a mask. Um, make of that what you will. I will repeat that I have no plans whatsoever. <laughs> As a duly sworn member of this body to raise a point of order under Rule 15.6.1, and furthermore, I quote to you, Article 1, Bill of Rights, the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. The object of government. Government is instituted for the security, benefit, and protection of the people in whom all political power is inherent together with the right to alter, modify, or reform government whenever required by the public good. If a face mask covering shield gator is not in the public good, 
then I don't know what is. Thank you. Members, we're on the A52 amendment to the A51 amendment. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, the good, healthy debate, it's probably better that we're debating each other than poking at the governor. This is a, this is a serious issue. It's not gone away. It got very political within a uh, election cycle. And, and uh, I think the place that we are is threading that needle. Um, as we began contemplating what to do this session, I really wanted people here in person, everyone, because I believe that our work is essential and I believe that it, it's done better in person. But talking to our nonpartisan staff and talking to uh, Senator Kent from the minority, uh, that was really not where they wanted to be. You know, so we're trying to find that compromise. Uh, many of you know that I had COVID in early November. I think the data and science will show that I am not very infected, even though I've, I've heard that there's the, the uh, recommendation that we wear a mask because they don't know. I think if you follow other viruses, my gut is in the end, it'll show that uh, was not uh, very infectious. And yet, I choose to wear that mask, not because I'm mandated, uh, but because I do believe there are a lot of people that are just very, very concerned about this virus and getting it, and it gives them some sense of peace of mind. And so for that reason alone, I do it. But to mandate people, I, I just find it is unacceptable. And yet, under emergency powers, that's what the governor gets to do there. But the compromise here is we're not going to have everybody in person. We're going to work with the nonpartisan staff, and I'm going to work with Senator Kent and the minority to find that path forward that we eventually do hybrid, and hopefully, God willing, we'll have everybody here in person because we've had those that need the vaccine to have the vaccine so that we can do our essential work. But we've got to be careful. I mean, you cannot point to the mask on everything and say that was the best thing to do. I've seen people in, in a car by themselves wearing a mask. It's like, why would you be doing that? I've seen little kids wearing masks, particularly in sports, and I've heard story after story after story about how harmful that has been to kids in hockey and other sports that it did not go well. So I think we can find a way through this. I'm encouraging people to wear the mask. I wear a mask on this floor right now. Everybody has a mask on. But I don't think we should be mandating it. It, it just, it, it in and itself, I think some other senator said that, is what causes some of the division. So I encourage everybody to wear the mask. Uh, but let's move forward and support the amendment to the amendment. So we had to change the Wi-Fi password, so I got to get that on. Members, we're on the A52 amendment to the amendment. A roll call has been requested. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll. Members in the retiring room, please come to the chamber to vote. Retiring room. Members, please remember to vote at your desk. Come in through the side doors of the chamber or through the retiring room and then exit through the front doors of the chamber. Members in room 303 and members in the president's office, please come to the chamber to vote. Room 303 and the president's office.
Again, members, vote at your desk. After you enter through the side doors, exit the chamber through the front door. Members in room 323, 237, please come to the chamber to vote. Rooms 323 and 237. And members in room 206, room 206, please come to the chamber to vote. I will now call on Senator Frentz to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.1. Senator Frentz. Well, thank you, Mr. President. On the A52 amendment, I report a no for Senator Carlson. Carlson votes no. Senator Frentz. I report a no for Senator Clausen. Clausen votes no. Senator Frentz. I report a no for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes no. Senator Frentz. I report a no for Senator Herr. Herr votes no. Senator Frentz. I report a no for Senator Isaacson. Isaacson votes no. Senator Frentz. I report a no for Senator Latz. Latz votes no. Senator Frentz. I report a no for Senator Newton. Newton votes no. Senator Frentz. And I report a no for Senator Torres Ray. Torres Ray votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll now call on Senator Jasinski to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.1. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes yes. Housley votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer votes yes. Limmer votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom votes aye. Westrom votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson B votes aye. Anderson B votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eichhorn votes aye. Eichhorn votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Goggin votes aye. Goggin votes aye. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 36 ayes and 31 nays, okay. the motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we are back on the underlying A51 amendment. Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I'm, I'm really disappointed. I uh, welcome having the debate over this, but data shows that masks do work. They're part of a, process, or part of a number of mitigation measures that we use and they do contribute to reducing transmission of the disease. So I'm disappointed. Um, I really think that Senator Gazelka's amendment um, really mean, made, makes it uh, a meaningless, it isn't a rule. So um, on that basis, I withdraw my amendment. Senator Wicklin withdraws the A51 amendment. Members, that puts us back on Senate resolution number six. Any further discussion on Senate Resolution Number Six? Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome back. I have an amendment. It's the A50 amendment. Senator Franzen offers the A50 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Franzen moves to amend Senate Resolution Number Six as follows: Page Five, after Line 18. Insert, this is the A50 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Franzen. 
Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment should be a easy one to understand um, since we've debated at nauseum how much we want to get back to normal and how we want to be in person and have a normal legislative session, which requires us to be here in person safely. This requirement in this, uh, this amendment would require members who are voting remotely and are not uh, physically present here to let us know where they are. Uh, we are no longer in the interim session. We're here in a normal, regular legislative session. A lot of us during the interim were at different places, whether it was our cabin, our family um, home, or other parts of their district in Minnesota and other parts of the state or the country. But in this case, we're back and we are organized in regular session. So I think it's uh, fair to say that members should be transparent where they are. Uh, in a normal session, and physical presence is something that we want to aspire to, but in lieu thereof, uh, members who should be uh, here and are not here presently uh, would let us know where they are, and that this would require a member voting from a remote location under this rule. Must inform the Senate President and members uh, of the member's geographic location of the time of remote voting. Again, it's in lieu of transparency, in lieu of uh, uh, keeping up with our uh, uh, rules and traditions of being here physically, but since we're not, uh, we at least want you to know, uh, we want to know if you're here in Minnesota. And by the way, if um, someone is out of state um, for a valid reason, they can always excuse themselves like we've always done. Thank you, Mr. President, and I urge a green vote. Discussion on the A50 amendment, Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, will Senator Franson yield? Senator Franson will yield. Senator Gazelka. So, thank you, Mr. President, Senator France, and I, I'm open to just letting the body decide what they think is best here. Uh, so, they can still vote, they just have to notify, even if they're in another state or another country, uh, you just want a, a full disclosure, is that correct? Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. President, and Senator Gazelko, correct. Uh, I know we have stories of people who have gone abroad during the pandemic to other places to be with family that are abroad or have vacationed other places. Uh, this comes up and even in my district uh, and when there's an issue with even security to vote, uh, uh, to use uh, local materials that are not easily transferable because of firewalls. So it does come up. This is merely just for our body to have transparency with our constituents that when we are in a regular session, we're expecting to be in the state of Minnesota. And if you're not, again, you can always excuse yourself. If you're taking your kids to a, a tour for their um, university or you have a valid reason, um, that's, that has always been the case, that you can always excuse yourself from your vote. Uh, no, I don't, I don't make senators change their password. Any further discussion on the A50 amendment? Outlook hadn't connected in over 60 days, so I think they yeah. just turned it off. Okay. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. So I take a look at this and I heard the words from Senator Franzen, but I don't see them in the language of this amendment. So those may be nice words, but they have no effect because what matters is the words here. Actually, I installed the one for you. Uh, that's what we use to do remote support. Yeah. So it's Members, up. any further discussion on the A50 okay. amendment? I'll just wait for it to okay. And if you have any other problems, put somebody else. Seeing none. All those in favor of the A50 amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. We will pause to gather the votes of the members in alternate locations.
for the members that are in the chamber who are scheduled to be in the chamber did not vote in another room if you support the A50 amendment please stand and members if you're not um, uh, if you're not seated in the chamber i just ask you to go off to the side please so we don't double count Okay, members, you may be seated. Mr. President, Mr. President, am I allowed to ask a question, point of information during a, during, it's uh, not a roll call, but during a vote? Uh, Senator Pappas, you are not, I'm sorry. Okay. On a vote of 23 to 21, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we are Mr. On. President, before you continue, Senator just uh, I just have an inquiry to make. The, um, the situation with the remote voters, like during that last vote, you did allow the people in the chamber to stand as if we were having a division. And it just seemed to me that when we're we're gathering remote votes, it's almost as well like a division. Yet the people who are on the phone, who are at home, who are voting remotely, are not allowed to participate in what appears to be a division. So I, I guess I strongly suggest during this session that we develop a method, um, Mr. Majority Leader, Madam Minority Leader, where when we have a division similar to that, where no one calls for a roll call, that the remote voters be allowed to participate uh, not as an individual vote, but as a division vote. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pappas. We appreciate the advice. Uh, what I was trying to do is gather the number of votes. It was not, nobody called for a division. It was not a division. I was just getting the number of votes of the members in the chamber the same way we did as the members in the alternate locations. Members, we are on, the, on Senate Resolution Number 6 as amended. Any further discussion? This resolution does require a roll call. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll. Members in the retiring room, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 303 and the president's office, please come to the chamber to vote.
Members in room 323, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in 237 and 206, please come to the chamber to vote. I will call on Senator Frentz to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.1. Senator Frentz. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Carlson. Carlson votes yes. Senator Frentz. I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Clausen. Clausen votes yes. Senator Frentz. I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes yes. Senator Frentz. I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Herr. Herr votes yes. Senator Frentz. I would like to report a no vote for Senator Isaacson. Isaacson votes no. Senator Frentz. I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Latz. Latz votes yes. Senator Frentz. I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Newton. Newton votes yes. Senator Frentz. And I report a yes vote for Senator Torres Ray. Torres Ray votes yes. And Mr. President, Senator if I may, Prince. I would like to uh, report a no vote for Senator Eaton. I think I said uh, no for Senator Eaton and also a no vote for Senator Latz. I think I said yes for both of those. Senator Latz changes his vote to no, or, sen and, or Senator Latz votes no. And That's correct, Mr. President. And Senator and Eaton? Senator Eaton, yes. Votes no, Senator Frentz, is that correct? And now, Senator Torres Ray votes no, Mr. President. So Senator Torres Ray votes no. Can you please report the vote for Senator Eaton, Senator Frentz? Uh, Senator Eaton votes no. Eaton votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. I will call on Senator Jasinski to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.1. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes yes. Housley votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer votes yes. Limmer votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson B votes yes. Anderson B votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eichhorn votes yes. Eichhorn votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebretson votes aye. Ingebretson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Senjum votes aye. Senjum votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Goggin votes aye. Goggin votes aye. Senator Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rood votes aye. Rood votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom votes aye. Westrom votes aye. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 52 ayes and 15 nays, the motion prevails and the resolution is adopted. The Secretary will report Senate Resolution Number 7. Senators Gazelka and Kent introduce Senate Resolution Number 7, a Senate resolution relating to standing committees. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate Resolution Number 7 be adopted. To that motion, Senator. Kazelka. Mr. President and uh, members, uh, this is the members on the committee, and uh, I want to say that we, I had a conversation with uh, Senator Kent and actually a few uh, senators from the minority, frankly from the majority as well, uh, but as a result of that conversation, um, at the last second we added four more uh, members uh, from the minority on four different communities, 
and I uh, put a letter uh, of understanding to uh, Senator Kent just saying it's our goal as we're moving forward to find a way to, to add a few more people in different places, and we may add some Republicans as well. Uh, we made the group smaller to get to the place of being in person sooner, and that's that's been difficult. And you know we know that that's that's a process we're under. Uh, we want to meet in person. We want to practice social distancing, just like we're encouraging everybody to wear the masks. But being in person to me is very critical, and so we're we're adopting a hybrid model where we'll uh, have technology. I believe in February we'll, we'll do a combination of the two. Uh, but in recognition of the, some of the frustration that we don't have enough people on the committees, we added four more, um, and we'll just see how that, that works, but we're going to take a look at that as we move farther on, and I, I want to publicly say what I said personally to the Senator Kent. Any further discussion on Senate Resolution Number 7? Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to express my appreciation to Senator Gazelka for very um, collegial conversations. I uh, believe he is trying to make this work in a difficult situation. Um, the idea of having more committees with fewer members achieves the goal of not having too many people in one place at one time. But we have to acknowledge that as a committee situation, that is not ideal. We have committees where we only have two members. And it is really hard to imagine that we get a good, diverse representation of the voices of all of Minnesota on these critical issues in the important work of committees when we do that. Um, again, I appreciate that the efforts have been made. We have made additions to some of the committees. But I will just remind the body and those who listen about um, Senate Rule Number 10.1. Um, and I know there are those who sort of roll their eyes, um, you know, when we start talking about rules and process, but they matter for a reason and they matter for reasons of representation. So the rule 10.1 says that the majority and minority groups must each be represented on all standing committees in, of the Senate substantially in proportion to their numbers in the Senate. And our 31 members of the DFL in this body represent 46.2% of this body, and we don't come close to that in terms of proportionality. So I just want to make that point on the record. I want to make that point because it is about representation. It is about the fact that we have new members who should have opportunities to learn these important issues. And so I think it's important, and I appreciate the letter that Senator Gazelka said and that he sent and that he is committed to continuing this conversation as we move forward. I hope that the technologies that we will have um, to allow us to stream more hearings are going to make it possible so that, that we can expand these committees and have better proportionality and come closer to this rule because it is an important rule, it is a valuable rule, and um, I look forward to us being able to do that moving forward. Thank you. Further discussion on Senate Resolution Number 7, Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Kent and members, just thank you for the input. Uh, we do look at uh, past president for, or precedents, I should say, for uh, the difference between the committees uh, because we absolutely want to follow some of the customs and practices and, and make sure that we're uh, in a range that's appropriate that gives each side a voice. I think the biggest thing here is because the committees are smaller, uh, I do agree that it's, it's, it's difficult when you only have a couple of people on a committee. So we'll keep working at it, uh, but I do appreciate that we're trying to work towards a good solution. Any further discussion on Senate Resolution Number 7? Members, this resolution does require a roll call vote. We're on final passage of Senate Resolution Number 7. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll. Members in the retiring room, please come to the chamber to vote. <laughs> Members in room 303, and members in the President's office, please come to the chamber to vote. 
303 in President's Office. Members in room 323, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 237 and room 206, please come to the chamber to vote. I'll call on Senator Jasinski to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer votes aye. Limmer votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom votes aye. Westrom votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson B votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eichhorn votes aye. Eichhorn votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Senjum votes aye. Senjum votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Goggin votes aye. Goggin votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rood votes aye. Rood votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson votes aye. Johnson votes aye. I will call on Senator Frentz to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.1. Senator Frentz. Why, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Carlson votes aye. Carlson votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Clausen votes no. Clausen votes no. Senator Frentz. Senator Eaton votes no. Eaton votes no. Senator Frentz. Senator Herr votes yes. Herr votes yes. Senator Frentz. Senator Isaacson votes no. Isaacson votes no. Senator Frentz. Senator Latz votes no. Latz votes no. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes yes. Newton votes yes. Senator Frentz. Senator Torres Ray votes yes. Torres Ray votes yes. Thank you, Mr. President. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and seven nays, the motion prevails and the resolution is adopted. The secretary will report Senate Resolution Number Eight. Senators Gazelka and Kent introduce Senate Resolution Number Eight, a Senate resolution relating to postage. Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, I move that the Senate Resolution Number Eight be adopted. To that motion, Senator Gazelka. This is for a Senate postage that we use. Discussion on Senate Resolution Number Eight, Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I offer the A51 Amendment and ask for a roll call. Uh, 
Senator Bigham offers the A51 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Bigham moves to amend Senate Resolution Number 8 as follows: Page 1, Line 5, delete. This is the A51 amendment. Uh, roll call has been requested. Roll call granted to the amendment. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so. We do a lot of communication electronically, um, of course, with social media, texting, Zoom, um, telephone. And I, I just think that when we're looking at having to make some tough fiscal decisions, we kind of have to start looking at our house a little bit. And um, ma mail, stamps, it's a big, it's a big deal. Uh, we want to continue to communicate, obviously. Um, give flexibility to each member to communicate with their constituents um, as much and as frequently as we can. But um, there's just a lot of stamps that are um, left over. It's a, it's a large amount. Um, so what I'm proposing is to drop the, from uh, 1300 down to $1,001. And I know that sounds odd. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the finance chair um, might be going, that's kind of an odd number. But what it does is it um, allows for 1,820 stamps, um, which is even, um, so you get the book, so that it's easier to disperse. So um, I just think that we do more things over uh, electronically, and I just think that this is one area where we can tighten up a little bit. And um, so that is really the point of the amendment, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, um, I would recommend that we not adopt this amendment. Uh, I, I certainly am open to more discussion. I, I think the, the movement to more digital certainly is a factor that we have been discussing. Uh, Senator Dietzik uh, was, was discussing some ideas that I said, let's pick up later. Um, but I would recommend that we not adopt this uh, and when we can move forward. You don't have to spend the $1,300 if you want to spend a thousand and one, um, you can do that, but uh, I'd recommend that we take a little bit further discussion before we make a change like this. Some of us still like to send out letters, uh, myself included. Uh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. President. And you know, the, and I agree with uh, Senator Gazelka. The issue that I have is that's fantastic and great if you've got a, a district that has internet. Uh, many of us have many of our constituents that don't have broadband, and let alone the internet. So I would suggest that uh, once we get broadband and internet throughout the state, we can take another look at this. Thank you. Any further discussion? Senator Marty. Mr. President, um, I, I do have sensitivity to the concerns of people who don't have broadband and internet, but uh, when I look at the budget over the years for postage, it, doesn't seem to go down. It stayed pretty close the same, I think, over the years, even though we moved from a predominantly just where people were mailing thousands of letters down to ones where many people don't send out that many letters anymore. And I think this is more of a symbolic move than anything else, but I think it does save a significant amount of money anyhow, and I think this is something we ought to discuss. i kind of disappointed we didn't consider the rules temporary rules, at least in rules committee. I think we should have more discussions on this, but for right now, I think this is a reasonable amendment to help open that discussion more. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you, Senator Marty, for that reminder. It actually saves um, a little over $20,000, so just for the record. Any further discussion? Members were on the... A51 amendment, a uh, uh, roll call has been requested. See no further discussion. The secretary will take the roll. <laughs> Members in the retiring room, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 303, please come to the chamber to vote. And members in the president's office, please come to the chamber to vote.
Members in room 323, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in rooms 237 and 206, 237 and 206, please come to the chamber to vote. I'll call on Senator Frentz to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I report a yes for Senator Carlson. Carlson votes aye. Senator Frentz. For Senator Clausen, I report a no. Clausen votes no. Senator Frentz. For Senator Eaton, I report a yes. Eaton votes aye. Senator Frentz. For Senator Herr, I report a yes. Herr votes aye. Senator Frentz. For Senator Isaacson, I report a no. Isaacson votes no. Senator Frentz. For Senator Latz, I report a yes. Latz votes aye. Senator Frentz. For Senator Newton, I report a no. Newton votes no. Senator Frentz. For Senator Torres Ray, I report a no. Thank you, Mr. Torres President. Torres Ray votes no. I'll call on Senator Jasinski to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes no. Housley votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer votes no. Limmer votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom votes no. Westrom votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Newman votes no. Newman votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson B votes no. Anderson votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eichhorn votes no. Eichhorn votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes no. Ingebrigtsen votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Senjum votes no. Senjum votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Goggin votes no. Goggin votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rood votes no. Rood votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes no. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 20 ayes and 47 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Members, we're back on Senate Resolution Number 8, Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, we got an email back in December saying that we could order uh, 6,000 letterhead and envelopes. And um, so several members were asking, you know, why do we need just letterhead? Could we do note cards? So as we were researching that, um, our fabulous staff came across the policy manual on page 63, and it talks about senators receive a postage and stationary allowance in accordance with the adoption of the Senate resolution at the beginning of every legislative session. So at some point, uh, 
They must have included the stationary allowance and with the posted resolution. When we did some research back to 2009, we found that you know, the stationery was not included in there. So it's kind of custom and usage right now. Um, but for consistency's sake and transparency's sake and for just cleanup's sake, I thought that, you know, we either amend today's resolution or we go and have a rules committee discussion and we amend the um, policy manual. Uh, I would suggest that we do that or I would recommend or request that we have a rules committee to discuss, possibly including note cards in with the letterhead. Um, I know a lot of people like to do those personal note cards. Um, it makes it a little more, if you just want to do two lines, it's a little, just formatting looks nicer. Um, and also I think they want to place the orders by January 22nd, so I think we should uh, maybe have that rules committee to discuss this um, and clean this all up. So um, I've had this discussion with Senator Gazelka, and I think we're going to look at that. Thank you. Senator Gazelka. Yeah, uh, Mr. President and Senator Dietzik, I, I appreciate the process, which is exactly what you've approached, and I do think we should try to way, uh, find a way to clean some of those things up, and I do thank you for, to, uh, for bringing it to my attention. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dietzik and uh, Senator Gazelka for bringing up this issue. I just have to share something with you all about Senate tradition, and that is in 1991, in the old days, when I came over here from the other body, one of the first questions I asked the Secretary of the Senate, Pat Flavin then, is, why are we only ordering stationery? Why don't we include note cards like the other body does? So here we are 30 years later, and I, I admit that I've neglected this issue over the decades. It's not, doesn't look very good to my credit that I didn't keep after it, but better late than never if we could actually have no cards. And then I'd also ask you that why not consider business cards as well for the senators and for their LAs? I mean, if that's, I don't need 6,000 pieces of stationery, and, but I do need no cards and I do need business cards, and why not just have like a, a allotment that had a, um, uh, some choices for the members for a change. Break with Senate tradition. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, members, we're on Senate resolution number eight. This resolution does require a roll call. The secretary will take the roll. <laughs> members in the retiring room, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 303 and the President's office, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 323, please come to the chamber to vote, as well as members in room 237 and room 206, please come to the chamber to vote.
I will call on Senator Frentz to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.1. Senator Frentz. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Carlson votes yes. Carlson votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Clausen votes yes. Clausen votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Eaton votes yes. Eaton votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Herr votes yes. Herr votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Isaacson votes yes. Isaacson votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Latz votes yes. Latz votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes yes. Newton votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Torres Ray votes yes. Thank Torres you, Mr. Ray President. Torres Ray votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer votes aye. Limmer votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Westrom votes aye. Westrom votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Eichhorn votes aye. Eichhorn votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Senjum votes aye. Senjum votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Goggin votes aye. Goggin votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Rood votes aye. Rood votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Johnson votes aye. Johnson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Osmick votes aye. Osmick votes aye. All members voting who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 67 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the resolution is adopted. Members will now take up the Senate agenda. Uh, we'll begin with the second order of business, executive and official communications. Uh, please make note of the communications. There's no action, uh, and those communications will be referred as indicated. No further action. Uh, next, we'll move to the third order of business, messages from the House. The Secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House of Representatives of the State of Minnesota is now duly organized pursuant to law and has elected the following officers. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. There's no action required on that message. Uh, the next order of business is the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of Senate bills. Listed in today's introduction calendar are Senate file numbers 1 through 25. These Senate files will be given their first reading and referred as indicated. Next, we'll move to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Um, before I call on Senator Franzen, I have a couple announcements uh, for the members. First, uh, when you're signing your name on the yellow bill jackets, uh, please make sure you sign your name legibly, last name only, with ink. So please make sure the front desk can read your last name when you sign the bills and sign them in ink. And apparently they're already having difficulty reading some of those last names. So please make sure the staff can read those. And then also, 10 minutes after session, so immediately following session, 10 minutes after, there is Zoom training. So training on Zoom, please check your emails for additional information. Uh, further announcements of Senate interest, Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. President. And I have two announcements, and I will begin with one that's really dear and personal to our Senate family. Uh, many of you might have uh, received communication about one of our dear lobbyists that passed away this week, uh, Eric Dick. And I just want to uh, have a moment of silence for him. Eric and I worked really closely together on the issue of price, uh, uh, power authorization, and PBM. So um, that's why I'm really um, stoked about that issue because I worked with him for over a year and with uh, Minnesota Medical Association. 
I, I got to know him in a way that, um, you know, he made democracy work. He made this place work better. He was also a member of our Senate staff. He was the committee administrator for Senator Mimua in judiciary. And I want all of you to just hear from uh, just his spirit and just at least a remembrance of the, the place that he touched that I'm sure he loved because it was a delight to work with him. And I just received the news yesterday and it really, really um, <sighs> just, uh, it felt like family. It felt like we had lost family. And, and that is what this place is. It really is a family. And I don't care if, if, if we're really viciously arguing against each other on an issue. At the end of the day, we're all human beings and we're here because we believe in democracy, we believe in this place, and we believe in the rule of law and the state of Minnesota and the Minnesota Senate. So I wanna thank uh, Eric for his contributions to this institution. And I wanna send my condolences on behalf of the Minnesota Senate to his family. And if you all would indulge in a moment of silence on, um, to send, uh, say farewell to our friend, Eric Dick. Members, please stand for a moment of silence. Thank you, members. Further announcements, Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. As of yesterday, it wasn't bad enough. Uh, we also witnessed some horrific news across our country. And I had the intention to present a resolution today, but because we are low on staff and we are ro working remotely and just the, the way that this place works, I would not, was not able to have the resolution ready for you all today to vote on but I intend to vote on it uh, or introduce it for Monday. And it's related to uh, everybody who received the news, uh, their paper. This is the Wall Street Journal talking about mob storms at the Capitol, at the US Capitol. Our local paper, the Star Tribune, talks about an insurrection. What happened last night and what continues to uh, play out in our country is something that we cannot be silent. I cannot be silent. It's easy to be silent because we don't want to be in the spotlight, because we don't want to be combative or potentially hurt someone's feelings or hurt someone's um, ideology. But when things like this happen, it is our duty, in my opinion, that we need to call it out, that we need to stand unified as a body, as a country that's worth fighting for. It's our democracy that's at stake. It's why we were elected. I've had the privilege to be here since 2012 was my first election, and I remember walking into the members-only celebration, sitting next to Senator Weger. And I don't know if he remembers that, but I remember it vividly, because I felt kind of out of place as one of the youngest members of the Senate. And I know that Senator Miller and I were in that class one of the youngest members of the Senate. And I felt welcomed. I felt that it was just people trying to do the best we can. He welcomed me with open arms, didn't care my background really, just as a person, he was trying to help me learn the ropes. My first term, and frankly, my first years here, I felt like Minnesota was in a good place, that we had great leaders on both sides of the aisle, that we were collegial, that we worked together, that we had our differences, but we were able to work them out. Fast forward to now, I cannot say that with a straight face. I worry about our state, I worry about our country, and I worry about our freedoms. I grew up in Puerto Rico. I've heard about trying to overthrow the Spaniards. I've heard, I, those things are still celebrated to some extent. There's rule and order. I'm a lawyer by trade. I swore in the Constitution that I would uphold the laws of the state. And just two days ago, we swore that we were gonna uphold the Constitution of the Minnesota State to do our job to preserve our freedoms and to preserve peace. My Senate resolution, or our Senate resolution, and I want you to consider it because I'd love for this to be something bipartisan that we can all agree to, is that 
we recognize that what happened on January 6th, that demonstrators in Washington, D.C. and other locations around, around the United States vandalized public buildings, threatened the lives of lawmakers, staff, and the general public, and jeopardized the peaceful transition of presidential power. The U.S. Constitution made the right to free speech the very first amendment of our Bill of Rights, but the behavior at the U.S. Capitol was a violent assault on our democracy that should be condemned and rejected by every American. All lawmakers have a duty at the state, federal, and local level to protect democracy and the safety of our communities. We are grateful for the Capitol Police officers who were working to keep member staff safe at the Capitol and hope, that their safety, and help, hope for the safety of those at risk. We lost four souls yesterday. The peaceful transfer of power has been a foundation and hallmark of presidential elections, and we are committed as a body to uphold the results of free and fair elections that was just held. Each member of the Minnesota Legislature swore an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, and to faithfully discharge the duties of their office. And we want the State of Minnesota and the Senate, this chamber, to condemn the violent behavior in our nation's capital on January 6. The full Minnesota Senate rejects, rejects any attempt to subvert our state or our nation's constitution or our great democracy. Members, let's not be silent on something so serious. Mr. President. And that's all. Thank you, members. Senator Kiffmeyer, for what reason do you rise? Well, Mr. President, I thought the agenda item we were on was motions, I mean, was announcements of Senate interests and so on, not speeches. Is that correct? We're under announcements of Senate interest. Uh, next on the list, I have Senator Abler, followed by Senator Klein. Senator Abler. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the work that uh, we did today. We're still trying to get the hearing in for the Human Services Committee for at least just a few minutes to at least organize ourselves. So in about seven minutes, or quickly as you can get your Zoom camera on, please come say hello to the Human Services Committee on Zoom. Uh, thank you very much. Senator Klein, followed by Senator Hoffman. We're under announcements of Senate interest. Senator Klein. Well, uh, Mr. President, thank you. And uh, I agree, this is the moment when we speak about announcements of general interest. And, and I also, like Senator Franzen, wanted to speak about the momentous events of yesterday, uh, which have affected us all so deeply, and speak about her resolution. Uh, I, if the body and you will indulge me, I'll, I'll promise to be very brief. And uh, Senator Klein, keep it brief. We're under announcements. We're, we don't have a resolution in front of us. So just keep your, um, your comments brief to uh, announcements of Senate interest, please. Uh, in that case, Mr. President, I'm going to defer and, and withdraw my, my announcements. They, they would go a little bit long, and I appreciate your indulgence. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President and, and members. As an able-bodied, as an able white man and, and uh, with privilege, I'm obligated to condemn the heinous acts that, that happened yesterday and, and the irresponsibility of what we saw that just absolutely is here and, and, and who, because of the color of their skin, they did not face the immediate consequences, but yet, we look at our own state capital, Mr. President, and hats off to our state patrol who did such an amazing job in being prepared and keeping this place safe. My daughter, Mr. President, reminded me of how on June 22, 2017, disability act activists protested on Capitol Hill against cuts to Medicaid that resulted in 43 arrests of people being removed from their wheelchairs and their mobility aids taken away. Not okay. Our Honorable Hubert Humphrey wisely said, the moral test of government and how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life and those who are in the twilight of life and then those who are in the shadow of life. So Mr. President, all I wanted to say was must we remember to protect life, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. President. Further announcements of Senate interest, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Happy to see you in the chair, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, yes, I understand we're under announcements of Senate interest, but yesterday was historic, and I think the people of Minnesota want to hear from us. I wanted to share a few thoughts about yesterday, and I think it's important for us to make some statements out of this chamber because we're at uh, an incredibly uh, momentous moment in our nation's history and with respect to our democracy. So I have a few comments written down, but I'll keep them as brief as I can. I will. I will uh, 
amend them. Um, Mr. President, I just wanted to say that uh, what occurred yesterday, of course, occurred a thousand miles away, um, but it also occurred right here in this chamber where the heart of democracy beats and hopefully beats in all of our hearts as well. Um, but Mr. President, I have to say, I hope that it beats in all of our hearts because we have seen now over the course of many years, the events that transpired yesterday didn't fall out of the clear blue sky. It is the manifestation of years of building a political movement that created the possibility of what occurred in our nation's capital yesterday. And those are, of course, attacks on basic norms and, and norms of, of decency and treating others fairly and delegitimizing those who have differing political views and a steady drumbeat of lies, distortions, and appeals to fear. So members, really my message is, and I'll cut to the chase, let us all look deeply inside our own hearts and examine ourselves and determine whether we have built our political careers, whether we projected our leadership, uh, whether we've run our elections on that basis, on fear, division, resentment, willing to run roughshod over the procedures, the traditions, processes, institutions of our democracy, like the sacred right of people to vote, like the rule of law, like the role of the media. Uh, Mr. President, I'll just wrap up right now by saying outside this chamber, there are 12 panels with amazing inspirational quotes. I would encourage everyone to stop and take a look at what our founding fathers and mothers had to say about what this place means, what our democracy means to each and every one of us. And I'll just share one of them. True liberty consists in enjoying not just our own rights, not, not in the destruction of the rights of others. So Mr. President, we have a moment. Hopefully it's a reset and it's a call to action. And I hope we take that opportunity. In Minnesota, we can do better. Thank you. Next, I have Senator Fateh, followed by Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Fateh. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I also feel compelled to speak about the events that took place yesterday, and I'll try to be brief as well. Um, I stand before you all as a black man, a Muslim, a Somali, and an American. This summer, a black man, George Floyd, was murdered in our district. What we then saw was a public outcry, speaking out against the injustices that take place year after year after year, black and brown people being murdered. Those who stood up to protest and take to the streets were labeled as criminals and thugs by many including our GOP leaders at all levels of government. What we saw yesterday was an attempt to subvert our democracy. It was a push by anti-democracy, by anti-democracy protesters who stormed the Capitol during a purely ceremonial counting of electoral votes. Unfortunately, four people died as a result. These folks were not protesting an injustice. They were protesting against our democracy, in large part because of the lies that were being told to them by our President of the United States, by right-wing media, and by our GOP leaders at all levels of government. This is unacceptable. Today, many of us have spoken about unity. I want to believe in unity, but we need to see some action. We can no longer just accept words. S some commitment to our basic values as Minnesotans and Americans. I'm calling on our colleagues today as I have penned a letter with my colleague, Senator Jen McEwen, to call on our colleagues on the other side of the aisle to condemn the actions of our President of the United States, Donald Trump, and to reaffirm their commitment to our democracy and to a peaceful transition of power. Thank you. Members were under announcements of Senate interest. Obviously, I have 
had a little leeway today. Um, in the future, we are going to keep that to announcements of Senate interest. Senator Swazinski. Senator Swazinski, make sure your microphone's on. Did you hear me congratulate you? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Senator Swazinski. Um, I took students to Washington, D.C. for um, over 20 years, and what happened yesterday for me was like a kick in the stomach. And um, it was like my second home to my classroom, and, and um, it didn't... There, I have so many things I want to say, and, and my head's reeling, but I'm, I'm literally speechless about what we saw yesterday. And so I got a text from a constituent, and she said, are you safe? And I, th I think she thought I was a U.S. senator, which is another issue altogether um, that many of us face. Um, and I told her, yes, I am safe. And the first thing that occurred to me was all the people that go above and beyond their call of duty in this chamber to make us all feel comfortable and safe here. And I just want to um, speak out um, for all the people in this building and in this complex that give 100% to make sure that all the senators can do their business for the people of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, I was just notified by the Secretary that today's Zoom training is now canceled and rescheduled for Monday morning at 9 a.m. There will also be additional training sessions after that, but today's Zoom training is canceled and rescheduled for Monday at 9 a.m. Are there any further announcements from Senate interest? Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, members, uh, and uh, Mr. President in particular, I'm glad that you uh, left a little room for an opportunity for people to talk about this issue. It uh, Obviously, it shook us to a core, and as, what, as I begin to make some uh, comments about it, what we will you'll not find in my comments is right or left, Antifa or Black Lives Matter or Trump or all the different terms that we could use. I prefer to use American and un-American. And I talked uh, and condemned the violence that we saw in Minneapolis and Seattle and Portland and on and on and on as un-American. And yesterday what I saw at Washington, D.C., I condemned as un-American for people to go into our Capitol and actually go into the Senate and actually sit in the, the chair up front and break things and show total disrespect for our country. And if we're going to be united, it's not Republicans united by themselves, it's not Democrats united by themselves, it's Americans uniting against all acts of violence and, and destroying property and disrespecting people, I don't care who it is. And I'm happy to stand up and say yesterday was pathetic what we saw at the Capitol but I don't want to forget any of the other ones. There's, this, this is something that's been brewing on both sides that apparently their voices are not being heard the way they want them heard. And so I want to say I, I appreciate that our process at the federal level worked. It was a very, very close election, and there were more abnormalities than I've ever seen in an election, but each state goes through the process and decides and then picks their electors and they go to, to Washington, D.C. And that process is how we have a peaceful transition of power. And it came to the moment of yesterday where Vice President Pence followed the Constitution, followed the law, and followed through, even though some felt like he shouldn't and we should change these procedures, these, these laws, this Constitution, this gift that we have of an executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch is a gift. And the more we try to tinker with that, the more things we pull out of it, the less we have of who we are. And so now Democrats have the House, Senate, and President, 
and I hope and remind them as well, lead like Vice President Pence led. We don't need to do uh, a, a creating more, more Supreme Court justices so that we can get our way. We need to follow the Constitution, live within the boundaries that we have, and decide together that we're going to be united. I will tell all of you that I had a conversation with, with the governor yesterday, and it was about showing unity. Well, you all know that the governor and I, on a number of issues related to COVID, have, have really gone to war as far as pushing each other. But if you didn't see the moment yesterday, if you didn't see the moment in Minneapolis and Portland and Seattle, if you didn't see that we better unite and figure out how we all stand against these, these things that we know are not American. We cannot miss this moment. United we stand, divided we fall. And just remember, we are meant to be one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we all need to think about that. We all need to think about those places that we are running contrary to that. We're gonna have great debates in here, and we're gonna, we're gonna fight about issues, but we have to be very careful that we don't spill over into something that divides us into not one nation under God. So we're gonna do our part here in Minnesota. Uh, I, I am convinced that uh, we're, the Senate, the House, and the governor, we're going to pass a good two-year budget and we're going we're gonna to battle about ideas, but let's figure out how we do this together. Mr. President, uh, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, January 11th at 11 a.m. Senator Gazelka moves that the Senate adjourn until Monday, January 11th, 2021 at 11 a.m. All those in favor, say aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails. The Senate is adjourned.